What's up, people? It's your girl, Adeola. Did anybody watch that last debate between Barack Obama and Mitt Romney? I was glued to the TV, watching them whoop each other. I was like, yes, Obama, give it to him, give it to him. I felt like I was in that room, you know, but um, Obama couldn't see me, give him all the eye contact. I was like, this, Obama, Obama he didn't see me i don't know why they didn't say much about you know their plan to help african countries i don't know why anyway um after watching that debate you know i was like kai this is politics ah this is politics you know people debating each other what happened to debates in africa by the way especially in nigeria eh what happened look at me getting excited in another man's country eh because of the way that they are doing their own politics yeah so we used to have debates in nigeria eh Remember Abiola, MKO Abiola and Tofa in 1993? Ah, they had a debate now. What happened? Even Baba Yabo, eh, I mean Obasanjo, debated Olufalai in 1999. Eh? Although um, when it was time for his second term, Obasanjo refused to attend the debate. And he still won the presidency. I'm like, this can only happen in Nigeria. You know, a president that did not debate and he still won the election. Why am I not surprised? I mean, the election we had last year, President Goodluck Jonathan, who was the acting president at the time, yeah, he refused to show up for the debate organized by an independent body. Can you imagine? All the other candidates showed up, right? But he didn't. <laughs> and they still went ahead with the debate. I'm like, which kind of debate is this now? <laughs> <laughs> I was actually looking forward to hearing President uh, Goodluck Jonathan because I heard that he had a PhD. And then the Nigerian Elections Debate Group, you know, they decided to organize another debate. You know that that is a government-owned organization, right? They were on NTA, you know, the Nigerian Tataboko Authority. Yes, for those of you that are not familiar with it. And the other candidates, they all decided not to show up. So that Goodluck Jonathan was the only candidate that showed up for the debate. And the man showed up debating himself. This can only happen in Nigeria. <laughs> I have never seen anything like that, seriously, where a candidate would debate himself, you know? Well, that day he said that uh, if he becomes the elected president, you remember he said he would fix electricity. Eh, now lie. First thing that Nigerians always remind us of is the issue of power. These are things that we have been working on. And we believe that if given the opportunity for the next four years, we'll be able to get to a point where will stabilize power reasonably. So he debated himself and he still won the election. Ah, seriously, how did he convince people that that was a free and fair election? I'm just hoping for that day, you know, when there will truly be free and fair election in all African countries, you know, I'm still waiting for that day. Already, I think Ghana is doing well in this aspect, you know. Nigeria is actually doing better than some countries in Africa because some presidents have just refused to hand over power. Can you imagine? I don't understand. I don't understand how Theodore Obiang can still be in power after 33 years. Eh? Ah, in fact, I think the people of Equatorial Guinea, they must have accepted it that, ah, I guess this is our fate too. And I feel for the people of Angola, you know, where one man has been ruling them since 1979. Hey, since 1979. Can you imagine? And of course, my Zimbabwean brothers and sisters. Ah, I pity them. They are stuck with Mugabe eh, for the past 32 years. Hey, not 10, not 20. Hey, 30 years of Mugabe. I, I can't bear it. <laughs> that is just too much. Lord have mercy. Even the people of Cameroon, they've had poor beer for the past 30 years. Now, the good thing about Cameroon is every lady that I've met that is from Cameroon they know how to fix their hair with wig or weave on because you know they've had three decades to learn from the best of the best you know their first lady yes yeah, a doll she's a doll she's a doll Museveni of Uganda is also still in power for the past 26 years seriously and now the guy is like rapping these young people talk to me about this rap because I was not following what they were saying you want another rap and then the past and late prime minister of Ethiopia, mm, it was in power for 21 years. Ah, why is it now that African leaders don't like to hand over power? Eh? I guess his wife was also planning on succeeding him. Yes, that is why she didn't want to leave the palace. Eh? Mm, they don't like to hand over power. Ah, I don't know what it is. My hope is that one day and very soon, Mm? The African leaders will also practice good politics, yeah, holding debates. And I hope that all these crooks, you know, like Mugabe, will be removed someday. Eh, don't look at me like that. I'm just keeping it real. 
So you probably heard that rumor that Boko Haram tried to attack a plane in the mid-air in Nigeria. Hey, I started praying like father. And then somebody tapped me and said hey, it was a rumor that it wasn't true. So I said, oh, okay. No, according to the Department of State Services at least, they said that it was a mentally challenged man that got on the plane, that they were supposed to notify the airport authority, but they, they did not. Are you confused? Yeah, I'm confused too. Now the poor guy had been traveling with the wife of the secretary to the Bono State government yes and when they realized that this guy is like you know doing kind kind like he's mentally challenged yeah they decided to fly him back to Abuja from Maiduguri now when he got on the plane there was turbulence right during the flight and I guess that that was what triggered his mental you know the psychology and the state of his mind and the guy started acting out too. and of course all the passengers were like scared they were like hey Boko Haram has followed us to the plane you know they thought he was about to blow up the plane I would be scared too if I was in the plane somebody's acting scared, scared. especially because this plane was living from Maiduguri you know where Boko Haram has been operating from yeah honestly to say the truth I never knew that that any aircraft was still flying out of my duguri. But now I understand what that senator means, Senator Zina, when he said there are different types of Boko Haram. I said, eh, how did you know? But you know, we'll talk about that another time. Anyway, what's funny to me is that when they finally landed, they took the man into custody instead of, you know, taking him to the hospital. And I don't know the guy, who, and I'm not speaking for him, but I hope that this guy is not being abused. I said, why are they taking the guy to the police station now huh? instead of taking him to the hospital? And because we have this culture of abusing mentally challenged people, we like to tie them down and beat them as if that would, you know, cure the mental disease. Eh? You know, I'm just talking about the way we treat mentally challenged people in general. It's nothing to write home about. And I found out that this is not just in Nigeria. Ah, take a look at what happened in Ghana. Ghana has over 2 million people with mental disabilities, out of whom over 600,000 require critical mental health care attention. There is very little care available. Ghana's three public psychiatric hospitals are understaffed and unhygienic. Patients are often held against their will and forced to undergo treatment. Doris Appi has spent years in and out of these hospitals. You don't have control over anything that is done to you. You go and it's done for you and you come back to the world confused. <laughs> With so few choices for treatment, many people with mental disabilities and their families turn to prayer camps, where they rely on preachers to heal them. In some prayer camps, people are chained, forced to fast, and made to live in unsanitary conditions for weeks, months, and even years. Honestly, mm -hmm, that's a general attitude towards the mentally challenged people. And, and it has to change, honestly. Ah, these people are people too now. And most of the time, the mental illness can be treated. See, I believe in prayers. I believe in miracles. Eh? But I don't think we need to tie people down for months and years. Ah, because let me tell you, with the way things are right now, anybody can suffer from mental illness. Ah, hmm. like I heard that the first lady of Kenya is, she's doing well, you know? Yes, yeah, she, she's like, cuckoo, 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 you know, but she, she's, she's okay. You didn't hear anything from me. Uh, but you know, she's living treatment. You can be a first lady and still, you know what I mean? In fact, if you live in Lagos, there's no way you can convince me that you are not mentally... Uh, yes, uh, because even if you are perfectly okay, you have to deal with a lot of mentally disturbed people every day. You fight to get in the mall where you fight to sit down. Eh? And if you decide to take Okada, by the way, they're about to ban Okada in Lagos. So we'll, we'll come back to talk about that some other time. But you know, when you take Okada, hmm, the way the driver will be speeding, going between cars, eh? Be going like this, like this. You will think you are about to hit a car, and then you be like, hey, oh, no, you know, you'll be praying until you get to where you're going. And then the police, the bullion vans, ah, that is why Fela said, Oju Elegba, Muto, they come from left, Muto, they come from right, from center. Eh? There's no way you won't lose your mental stability by the time you get to where you are going, which is why people from Lagos they talk differently. They'll be like, ah, Egmo, Egwaha, wait till you then, ah, Mas, Mas, Mago, ah, don't play me nonsense. Says, me, I'll be Lagos boy. Eh? This is not normal. <laughs> Don't write me any private letters. I know you are all okay. You are not mentally challenged. And even people living abroad, eh? you have no idea what many of them are going through just to pay bills. Hmm. And then if your family is not here and it's just you, ah, Kai, that loneliness, it can drive somebody crazy. Eh? Add that to the daytime, nighttime, part-time, full-time, overtime, an extra job that you have in the cold time. Or I mean in the winter, you are like this. And you are praying, Father, just get me through this season. Eh? That 
one can drive people crazy, you know. But all this can be treated, yes, they can be treated. You don't have to tie somebody to your local tree just because they are fed up with life and they begin to manifest some strange behaviors. It's perfectly normal. I think it's okay to be crazy sometimes, just once in a while. <laughs> there are mentally challenged people everywhere in New York. They are all over the subway. But the thing is, America has a lot of rehabilitation centers for these mentally challenged people. That is why they have all these drugs. Baxil, Soloft, Lagatil, Xenax, and Prozac. You know, just to cool people down. Although those drugs, their side effects can be dangerous. People can commit suicide <laughs> after taking them. <laughs> you know? Anyway, uh, some of these people have been completely healed and they're doing well today. It will be good if we also start thinking about investing in rehabilitation centers. Eh? But you know, I'm just hoping that the incidents of the plague will not give the Boko Haram people any strange idea. You get me? I hope that we can tighten our security at our airport. Mm, you know, I'm saying it now. We really need to tighten up our security at airports. Eh? Don't you agree? Eh, anyway, you know me. I'm just keeping it real. Moving on to Zimbabwe, there's this 14 year old girl that has been in the news for quite some time and you know I'm really proud of her you know because she got enrolled in the university at the age of 14. Hey, this girl's story, Moa Chifamba, it's quite inspirational. Yes, that is what I like to call defying all odds to achieve your dreams, to become somebody in life. I like stories like that. By the way, Muad's case is different from that 15-year-old Nigerian girl in New York, the one who got admitted to 13 universities, Ivy League schools, you know, like Harvard, Princeton, Columbia, you know, those top schools. Yes, this Nigerian girl, Sahila Ibrahim, such a beautiful and bright young lady. Yeah, she's now in Harvard University, you know. God bless her. But like I said, Muad's case is different because Muad came from what you would call a very, very poor family in Zimbabwe. In fact, her family could not afford to send her to school. And she was just five when her father passed away and her mom had also passed away last year. But this girl decided to teach herself how to read and write and study. Hey, she studied so hard that she was ahead of all those people that were going to school. Can you imagine? I mean, what can make a young child have that kind of determination, you know, to school herself such that she excelled and she did it. She took the A-level exam at the age of 13 and she passed. And my people, that is how she got enrolled at the University of Zimbabwe in Harare with a $10,000 scholarship. And that is enough to cover all her tuition. So I like to challenge you. I don't know what your situation is, but if this girl can be where she is today with self-determination, without anybody's help, then you too can pursue your dream as well. Please don't give up. No matter what the situation is, no matter what has happened, my people, you can overcome all obstacles. Don't give up. If you don't remember anything from this episode, just remember as long as you have breath. There is still hope, okay? Me, I know what I want to be when I grow up. But I won't tell you, yes. I won't tell you because I don't know all the enemies of progress. I don't know who can be after you, yes. But I'm meeting with the Nigerian First Lady next week for private coaching. Yes, because I believe anything is possible. I'm, I'm keeping my hopes up, you know. Mm. Me, I'm just keeping it real. Speaking of children, did you guys hear about those three kids in Naivasha, in Kenya? Hmm. They were traumatized last week when their father had a fight with their mom and he hit her on the head with a stool table. Well, no one knows if she actually died at that time, but you know, he didn't take her to the hospital, so there was no way to tell, but she eventually died. Anyway, as soon as the guy realized that his wife was no longer breathing, guess what he did? He decided to run. But before running away, he locked her up in a room with the three children. Can you believe it? So that the kids won't go and report him to the police. Kai, people are wicked. So the children spent the night in the room with the dead body of their mother. Kai, just imagine for a second how that was like for those children. Unbelievable and very traumatizing to say the least. It was in the morning that the neighbors heard the cries of these children and they went and forced the door open. Now the police have declared the guy wanted. You know, I have absolutely no respect whatsoever for any man who lays his head on his wives. Mm, no, no exception to that rule. Ah, if you are beating your wife, I have no respect for you and I pity you. <laughs> I pity you. How can you marry a woman? Eh? and beat her up just because you have a misunderstanding. Are you not going crazy? You know, that's just wrong, you know? And to leave the dead body with the children all night, that is double crime. Kai, for children to spend the whole night with a dead body. And speaking of dead body, hmm, I've been hearing a lot about people who work in Kenyan mortuaries. Ah, hmm, do you know that some people that work in mortuaries, they are sleeping with the dead bodies? Eh? I rebook, I get back to the sender. I said, eh? These guys, they will wash the dead bodies 
and then they will actually sleep with each dead body for several days. Eh? And then they will move to another dead body. I say, hey, this is crazy. You are dreaming on a dead body. Ah, you are not even afraid. You are not afraid for yourself. In fact, one of them said he has a wife and a child. The wife doesn't know that he's sleeping with dead bodies. Oh. So you can imagine, when he comes home, eh, he will still do with her. Ah. Not knowing that he's been sleeping with dead bodies. God, poor woman. Very soon, you will say you have mental problem. In fact, these are the kind of people that when they have mental problem, they really need to be changed. Seriously. Let me tell you, your problem is just starting if you're sleeping with dead people. Eh, some diseases will soon follow. And by the way, this is not the work of the witches or wizards in your village. It is the work of your own hands. I only pity the wives. Kai, they will say it is their father in their village that is after them. Hey? Can you imagine people looking for trouble by themselves? Hey? If you have a spouse that is working in mortuaries, just be careful. Ask questions. Hey? Don't just assume anything. The sad thing is that many of these guys are actually young guys, you know, sleeping with the dead bodies. They are young guys. Kai, see what this world is coming to. You know me? I'm just keeping it real. Now, who says you can't do it after you turn to a certain age? Eh? Hmm. I guess it's because they've not heard about that Indian man. Yes, the one that just gave birth to his second son at the age of 96. Hmm? That is what I call a miracle. This man, Ramjim Raghav, he became the world's oldest father two years ago when he had his first son at the age of 94. Now he has another baby. At 50 years old, Raghav's wife gave birth to their baby boy in India's northern Haryana state on October 5th. The couple initially became famous in 2010, when at 94, Raghav fathered his firstborn son. He says he remained a bachelor and was celibate until he met his wife about 10 years ago. I'm so happy for this couple, you know, it's like ah, something that is happening after they didn't think it's possible. I mean, even the wife has passed the childbearing age. That is a miracle. I was hoping though that there would be some kind of award that comes with being the oldest father. Everybody is saying, oh, he's the world's oldest father. Why can't you give him some kind of money? Hey, didn't you see where him and his wife are living now? I mean, something is not right. Eh? Anyway, the lesson to learn from this man is that mm, the guy is saying two children are enough for Mm. <laughs> you know, family planning. <laughs> he's cutting his coat according to his size. Hey, the guy is saying, I don't want any more children. You know, he's just keeping it true. And he reminds me of that wise man in Ethiopia. You know, the one that had 77 children. Yeah, did you hear about that? Like a long time ago, the man that had 77 children and 11 wives. Hmm. That man is wise because he was telling everybody then. It was all over the news that, hey, don't have too many children. No, see me now. I have 77. I can't take care of them. They ca I can't send them to school. I can't even give them land. You know, the man was very straightforward with people. Like, people do not do like I did. Do not have too many children. So he was advising everybody. Although, I wonder how far his advice would go because his first son already had three wives at the age of 30. I'm like, dude, you need to talk to your son first. So if you don't remember anything from this episode, just learn from that 96-year-old man. Cut your clothes according to your size. Shook, you know? I'm just keeping it real. Before I leave today, I want you guys to see a little bit of Seychelles. Alright y'all, it's been real. Don't forget you can send me emails. Let me know what you think about the show. And you know, you can follow me on Twitter. It's been real and I'm keeping it real right up in here. Until next week, I'm going to see y'all later. Peace out.